Hello. Hey. Welcome. Welcome everyone. How are you guys? Excited? All right. So uh, tonight, uh, my name is Raj, and we have a very nice evening planned for you tonight. And uh, we are going to talk about disruptive innovation. And uh, innovation, I think, is a uh, one of the most overused word in the valley. Uh, you talk to anybody, and you talk about innovation. Innovative design, and innovative software, innovation in robotics. I think uh, you can say that the foundation of Silicon Valley is based on innovation. And uh, uh, the amazing thing about it is like everybody has its own uh, definition of uh, innovation. Uh, I was actually having a discussion with some of my colleagues. And I sent an uh, email to a group of people in the company and, uh, asking what they think is innovation, what, uh, uh, how we can innovate. 
and everybody came up with like a different definition of innovation. Somebody said uh, it is about uh, creating something new. Somebody said it is about uh, solving existing problem in a new way. And somebody even said that uh, it is just doing something new. So uh, I was like really impressed. Like they all are true, right? I mean, there's no single definition for innovation. Innovation is how you define it. Uh, what is uh, and uh, uh, you can imagine how excited I was when I first talked to Matt, and uh, I saw that how he has innovated uh, his way and disrupted a number of existing markets, and uh, he has been there, done that, and uh, so I'm, uh, it's an honor for all of us uh, to. Uh, so I, I would like you to welcome uh, Matt. Uh, he's going to uh, talk about disruptive innovation tonight, and but before that, we have a small game for you, uh, and. Uh, I want to invite Susan on the stage. You all have received my email about Igniter 6 word. So we'll just play uh, that game here for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll start the session with Matt McEwen. So, Susan. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Please um, think about six disruptive words. You got the email from Raj, and we want you to think about that. and. Join the game. It's really fun. And you might be a winner. And you'll win Mrs. Moskowitz's munchies. There'll be at least three winners. So look at the screen. And that's the Twitter address for you to enter. And the example is create new markets, disrupt existing markets. And so with your smartphone, go ahead and enter. We'll give you a few minutes. You have a question? Those of us who aren't clever with words, can we buy Mrs. Moscow with your question? You'll be able to buy it in March. I'm almost legal, and I'll be able to sell it in March. So this is just tempting you. Okay. All right. All right, so uh, let's get started with the main session. Uh, please welcome Mr. Matt uh, Mikivis on the stage. Thank you for that great Thank you for that great Let's see. I'm ready to innovate some new audio technology. So disruptive innovation. If you haven't read the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, please pick up a copy at the end of this session. It charts disruptive innovation using the hard drive industry as an example. It contains a lot of fascinating data and insights into how to um, create profitable businesses by fucking with the status quo. So disruptive innovation, let's define it. According to Wikipedia, disruptive innovation displaces existing businesses in a way that the market does not expect typically by designing for a new set of consumers and later by lowering the prices in an existing market. So disruptive technology, as you can see in this chart from the book Innovator's Dilemma, just cuts through all the existing players and ultimately ends up winning in any existing market. According to the Harvard Business Review, disruptive companies earn 20 times as much money as existing players in the industry and are six times more successful. Some impressive numbers there. So let's look at some examples of companies that have really disrupted in the last couple of years. First and foremost is Square. The founders of Square said, what if anybody could accept credit cards simply by attaching a dongle to their cell phone rather than having to pay a $500 or $1,000 application fee to open a merchant account, submit to background checks, wait weeks and weeks for the application to get processed, and they opened up credit card processing to a whole new segment of consumers that previously were unable to accept credit cards. Now you see Square at food trucks and farmers markets and all sorts of small local merchants that previously were unable to 
except Visa and MasterCard and Amnex. The guy here, you might not recognize him, you might do. His name is Barry. He created a marketplace called Second Market. He said, what if I let accredited investors buy shares in private companies before they go public? So through Second Market, Barry essentially took Twitter and Facebook and Palantir semi-public by allowing credit investors to buy shares from employees and ex-employees of those companies. Decided to fuck with the NASDAQ market and with the New York Stock Exchange and allow people to buy stock in small private companies. Airbnb obviously disrupting their hotel industry and allowing people to make additional income by renting spare bedrooms. And iStock Photo is another example. Before iStock Photo came around, a traditional stock photo agency such as Getty Images would charge $500, $5,000, $10,000 to license just a handful of photos for your website. So iStock Photo said to themselves, why well, if we undercut the existing players in this space by more than 99% and sell stock photos for just a buck, a buck each versus $500, to $1,000, and this opened up a whole new segment of buyers who were previously unable to access stock photo imagery. So all of a sudden you had bloggers, you had marketers using stock photos in their banner ads, in their print magazine ads, people that were previously unable or to purchase from Getty Images and the other big stock photo libraries, including Colibris, which Bill Gates invested in, unfortunately. If you had bought shares in iStock photo, you would have made a lot more money. Uber obviously disrupted the taxi and limo companies and opened up a whole new segment of buyers. Before Uber came around, the market for black car services was quite small. It was very inconvenient. You have to browse through the yellow pages or go online and search for you know black car companies. You'd have to call them, book an appointment. You'd probably be paying by the hour. If you only needed a short ride across town, it wasn't practical. So by making it more accessible in a mobile app, they were able to blow up and increase the potential pool of buyers by a factor of more than 100x. Obviously, they've been incredibly successful in doing that. Plenty of Fish is another fantastic, fantastic example. They looked at all the dating websites that were on in the internet, Match.com, eHarmony.com, JDate, and they said, fuck those guys, we're just going to do it for free and make money through advertising. And the guy who has started Plenty of Fish now is a very, very wealthy man. He's making millions and millions of dollars in cash every single month with no outside investors simply by saying we're going to cut the price of dating sites to zero. So he decided to disrupt the existing model by finding a whole new set of people who otherwise wouldn't have been, who have never bought a Match.com or eHarmony membership but are happy to sign up for an account on Plenty of Fish, click on a few ads occasionally, and I'll make some enough money to you know, put them in really, really good shape. So this is some examples of interesting companies that have come up in the last couple of years. I uh, also want to talk about Hired.com. Hired is my latest company that I've co-founded with Doug Fierstein and Alan Grant. And Hired is a marketplace for recruiting. Um, one of the biggest challenges of the last 15 years that I've always faced as an entrepreneur is finding talented engineers. It seems that no matter what I did, I was always coming up short. I was posting job ads on Monster and Career Builder and Craigslist. It wasn't getting me anywhere. I was using my personal network, but that would be good for one or two hires. Oh, it's not good enough for the 10 people I need by the end of next quarter. I'd use recruiting agencies. At one point, I was using 30 different recruiters. It was still a terrible and miserable experience. So I decided at the end of this to try and solve the problem on behalf of every company in Silicon Valley, in New York, and eventually the world. So what we created was a curated two-sided marketplace for engineers, product managers, data scientists. And we said, anybody who's interested in potentially flowing to their career options and seeing what they're worth on the market and getting some interesting job offers, go on the site, create an application, and for one week only, you'll be visible to over 700 hiring managers. And those hiring managers will make you offers to interview and claim full salary and equity disclosure up front. So we launched this idea having no idea how well it would work. We rounded up 88 engineers from Google, Twitter, and Facebook. We put them on the site for a week. And they received over $30 million in job offers. That was our first test of this. It blew our expectations away by a 3x factor. It was so unusual, so different from the existing status quo engineers have to go through in the past in order to find new opportunities. 
And prior to hire, the only way is to job hunt, where you're using your personal network, which only takes you so far and only gets you into so many companies. Number two is you could submit your resume. You go on Airbnb and submit an application, but they might or might not get back to you. It might be a really long, drawn out process. At the end, you might just get a really low bar offer that doesn't match your expectations, and you just wasted eight or 10 hours in interviewing. And the third option before hired was using recruiters. The problem with recruiters is they're basically used car salesmen. No offense if anybody here is a used car salesman. I'm sure there's a few good ones in there, but recruiters work for companies. They don't work for candidates. Their goal is to close a deal so they can make their 20, 25% commission. And their only goal is to have the candidates stay at that job for 61 days so their money, their fee becomes non-refundable. So engineers using recruiters really created this really false dynamic because the recruiters were representing the company's best interests and not the engineers. So with Hired, we disrupted them all by flipping it on its head and saying, really, who's in control here is the talent. If you're a fantastic engineer, you're never going to have trouble finding a job, but let's create a platform, let's create a marketplace that allows you to do that on your terms without having to shoot resumes onto career sites, without having to deal with scummy recruiters, and allowing you to discover opportunities that you wouldn't have found through your own personal network at cool companies that you otherwise might have never ever heard of. So it's been going really great. This is the example of uh, you know, how high it works. We're basically a technology platform that disrupts agencies just like Uber disrupted taxi companies and just like Airbnb disrupted travel agents, travel agencies and Starwood and all the other big hotel groups. We're basically connecting buyers and sellers directly through a transparent, efficient market and automating a lot of the stuff that has traditionally been done very manually. So why, why, why did we launch Hire now? Well, first and foremost, it was getting really annoying for the last 15 years having to recruit talent and just being constantly blocked with all these obstacles and all these terrible me methods. Um, over and over again, I heard from engineers that they were getting bombarded with 5, 10, 15 spam emails a week from recruiters. They started blocking out the good opportunities with the bad opportunities. And it became a really boiler room experience, so we decided that we could use a marketplace mechanism to really create a lot of efficiencies in the marketplace. So over the past 12 months since we launched the business, we've signed up over 700 companies. We have some of the big names you might have heard of. We did this all without any marketing, simply because the candidates that we represent on our platform are curated and high quality. That all these companies just come to our door without any outside business development or sales effort. This is one of the big powers of creating something that's truly disruptive. Mm -hmm. We create something that's really 10x or 100x better than the next alternative. All the times the customers will just talk among themselves and come to you in a relatively short amount of time. So for all these companies, they're traditionally using job boards and outside agencies, and they have their own recruiting teams, and they still use LinkedIn to some extent. But the experience they have with Hired is so powerful that they've come onto the platform without really much effort on our part. Some more logos, lift, clear slides, staples, etc. That's a little bit about hiring and how we're taking on the recruiting industry. Um, but I want to talk a bit, a bit about 99designs, which is a company I spent four years of my life building before this. And for those that don't know, um, hired, uh, sorry, 99designs is a marketplace for crowdsourced graphic design, which essentially allows designers to earn money by competing solely based on their skills that they have and not on their location, not on their education, and not on their age. So what happens with 99designs is a small company or business owner comes to us, specifies a budget, it could be 500, it could be $5,000, they specify what they're looking for, a new logo, a brochure, a website design, and then designers from all over the world see these requirements, see the budget, and they compete for this money by submitting their best ideas to a marketplace. So a typical small business owner who's looking for a logo design on 99designs it's anywhere from 100 to 150 different designs to choose from. Um, and this is radically different and radically better than what came before 99designs. The old process was so fundamentally broken. I actually spent, I hate to admit this, I actually spent $10,000 on the logo for my first company. $10,000 I could have used for advertising, for marketing, for paying out bonuses to my employees. 
it was completely fucked up, and 99 Zax now has changed that forever. So you no longer have to ask for design recommendations. You no longer have to spend hours reviewing portfolios. You don't have to worry about the designer that you hired for your logo going on vacation in the middle of your project or ditching you for another higher paying project. And finally, because you have so many options to choose from, you have 100 or 150 designs that were created just for you, just based on your needs. The chances of you finding something that you're happy with is exponentially better, exponentially better than anything that came before 99 designs. So you're guaranteed to like a design or we send you 100% of your money back in cash, which is another fundamentally disruptive idea that we adopted at 99designs. No freelance designer, no graphic design agency, no creative studio in the world before 99designs will give you 50 or 100 or 150 designs and then ask you to, and then waive their invoice if you weren't happy with the results. So 99designs really eliminated a lot of the risk associated with with uh, obtaining and sourcing graphic design. So we eliminated, you know, the, the quotation process, you know, and after you report four years, you didn't have to negotiate contracts. You got a result you wanted in seven days versus seven or 10 weeks. You got hundreds of original concepts to choose from. And like I mentioned, if you don't like any of the designs, you got 99 designs, you're able to request a refund and get all of your money back. This was literally a 100x improvement on things that came before it. So since 99 Designs launched, we paid out $66 million to designers all around the world. We've helped 267,000 companies in over 150 countries source graphic designs for their small businesses. We have a new design being uploaded to the site every five seconds, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we've hosted dozens and dozens of designer meetups worldwide. There's now actually hundreds and hundreds of people um, who are making a full-time living off of the clients they find on our marketplace. These are some of the international meetups that we've hosted in East Asia when we did a grand tour. Um, all these people have fantastic skill. They have fantastic talent, but they're always cut off from opportunity. They never had a fancy business suit. They didn't have their office in midtown Manhattan, and therefore they couldn't get to access to the, mar to the U.S. market and the European market but by using 99designs, all of a sudden they can find thousands of new and interesting projects to work on every single week. They choose the projects that they're most interested and passionate about and that suit their needs and tastes and interests. And if they end up being the most successful designer, they get paid. Um, and they don't have to deal with any of the traditional hassles associated with invoicing, collection, contracts, etc. So since our Eastern European meetup, then we had like 70 or 80 designers show up. This is uh, one that we had in Indonesia. They created a huge billboard size mural that you can see there in the background. There's a group project, so there's a fantastic video of it on uh, YouTube that you can Google. So as we were creating 99 designs and we were getting all this great feedback, as we were getting all this great feedback from small business owners who were so happy with the results that they were getting, we also got a lot of shit from the existing companies that we were disrupting. The freelancers and the agencies who had previously charged me $10,000 for a logo weren't happy that all of a sudden they had all these designers who were competing purely based on their skill and not the fact that they had a Hugo Boss suit in an office in midtown Manhattan. So here on the screen you can see some of the headlines that we had to contend with on a daily basis. 99designs, the evil that changed names. 99designs, bullshit 2.0. Tax and cheapskates unite, immoral, blah, blah, blah. 99 designs sticks up two fingers at designers. That's one of my favorites there. Why designers hate crowdsourcing, exploitation as a business practice. Whenever you're endangering someone's livelihood, as many people felt we were doing with 99 designs, they lash out aggressively, and no amount of logic, no amount of argument or reasoning can change their mind. But what they weren't realizing is what we were doing is actually creating a whole new market of buyers. People that use 99designs to get a logo for $300 or $500 who have never in the entire world engaged a professional agency and paid $10,000. We're actually creating future clients for them 
just like iStock Photo create a whole new segment of buyers for stock photography. So obviously Uber has also faced very similar criticism. They've endangered the taxi cab industry. Many people who make a living driving taxis and they've had to deal with numerous issues, um, being served papers and being shut out of many different cities. Airbnb obviously has had a lot of backlash from the hotel associations who feel that Airbnb disrupts their livelihood and their ability to make a living. Airbnb, obviously Airbnb is even being faced with taxation in New York and um, San Francisco among other cities. So it's important to think as you're creating disruption, this is actually the sort of impact that you want to have. If nobody is getting pissed off over what you're doing, then what you're doing is probably not significant enough, at least when it comes to the tech space. It's actually really, really good to have this polarizing effect that you see with like we do nine designs, like Uber has the taxi associations, like Airbnb with the, with the hotels. It means that as long as your customers love you and the established status quo hates you, you're creating something that's fundamentally very meaningful. So creating disruption, I kind of want to walk you through a process, a bit of a framework that I've been working on about how you can think about ideas in sort of industries where you can really have a significant impact. What sort of questions should you be asking yourself when you're brainstorming ideas about new services and new products and new marketplaces to create? So first and foremost, like what services or processes are fundamentally broken, overpriced, or terribly frustrating? In my case, it was getting graphic design before 99 designs existed, having to contact 10 designers, wait weeks for them to get back, negotiate pricing and contracts and review portfolios and then end up paying $5,000 or $10,000 for design. I hate it. That was terribly frustrating purchasing experience. So it's no wonder that many more people didn't engage professional graphic designers. It was just too painful. Before I stock photo came around, if you wanted professional stock photography for your brochure, or your website, you actually had to call up Getty Images and fax paper contracts before I stopped photo came around. And with Hired, if I wanted to see resumes of engineers who were interested in interviewing for new jobs, I'd have to contact five or 10 or 15 recruitment agencies and then hope that a few of them email me resumes and I'd have to look through those resumes, email back to the agencies because those resumes were often censored for names and contact information. It was just a very painful process. Now with Hired, Every single week, companies can just come on board and view a curated list of talent that's interested in interviewing for new opportunities without having to go through the middlemen, without having to go through all the bullshit that's existed in the industry before. The other type of question you can ask yourself is what type of assets have no liquidity and need a marketplace that connects buyers and sellers? So what do people have that they would sell if it was only easier and less painful? Uh, my co-founder, Doug Fearson Kruse, founded a company called YouSell, where it's very easy to sell your iPhone or your iPad or other electronics that you have lying around the house without having to go through the process of auctioning it off from eBay, which is very painful and frustrating and time-consuming. Um, I also created a company called Flippa.com, which is a marketplace for buying and selling websites that has transacted over $100 million in websites, so I realized that there was a lot of people that were writing small blogs and websites that were making $500 or $1,000 a month in Google AdSense. And when they got bored of the project, there was really no way to liquidate that asset. So we created a marketplace where people could auction those websites and even auction old domain names that they were no longer interested in owning. And I created a liquidity in a marketplace that previously didn't have it. Some of the stats on Flippa, this is an older screenshot, but you know, sell a couple of million dollars in websites every single week. So the big thing to ask is how can you create an offering that's 10 times or 100 times better than the next best alternative? Unless you really want to spend a huge amount of your time and effort on sales and marketing and pushing the ball up the hill. If you spend all your time and effort up front instead on creating something that's well and truly 10 times better than the existing status quo, it'll save yourself a lot of effort and heartache later. Um, especially when dealing with startups, so something's only 50% better than the existing solution to a problem, it's actually really risky to switch to a new vendor, especially if it's a small three, four, five, ten person company. In order for a business to take that leap of faith 
or for them to switch a way of doing things in order to implement a new process or to subscribe to a new service or to adopt a new enterprise software in their company, they have to see an improvement that's much more than just incremental. Um, it has to be massively, massively better than what else is out there. This is a quote from Seth Godin, who's an author who's written numerous fantastic marketing books, including uh, The Purple Cow. Um, the quote says, when the thing you sell has communication built in, when it's remarkable and worth talking about, when it changes the game, marketing seems a lot easier. Of course, that's because you did all the marketing up front. When you invented the thing, save me the expense and trouble of yelling about it. I really like this quote. It's held true for 99designs. It's held true for Flippa. It's held true for Hired so far. I had to do very, very little business development and sale because the things that were created were so remarkably different and so remarkably better than the existing status quo that once the few, first few initial customers got a taste of it, they told their friends, they told their friends, they told the media, and the media told more people, and then it just kind of the ball rolls downhill. You no longer have to spend 40, 50, 60 percent of your budget on sales and marketing and buying banner ads and pay-per-click ads because what you have is unique, so much better than everything else out there. When, you, when your customers think of going back to the old way of doing things, it just seems too painful. So that's sort of the end goal if you're trying to create something really disruptive that becomes really, really big. Other questions that you can ask yourself when you're thinking about creating disruption and innovation hacking is how can you change the infrastructure, the rules of the game, or the flow of information? So as an example, on Hired, one of the big things that we created that never existed before in the recruiting industry is transparency around salaries. The companies all of a sudden were forced to make an actual number and attach it to every opportunity that they presented to engineers. That talent wouldn't have to waste time interviewing for jobs where expectations were out of alignment. Um, at the same time, we showed the companies what everybody else was offering. So on Hired, if we have John Smith from Google, who's interested in new jobs, and he gets three offers from Pinterest and Palantir and, and uh, 99 Designs, all those employees will actually see each other's offers, which creates competition and urgency and transparency, which had never existed before. Um, how can you redefine a service as a product or the other way around? Sometimes thinking about how you can change paradigms is a really interesting way of finding some interesting segments of the market that are in need of disruption. And finally, what services could be provided 90% cheaper or provided to a much wider market? How can you cut the price of something drastically? Not just by 50%. Not just by 60%, but what about 90%? Or even making it free in the case of Plenty of Fish, which all of a sudden killed the $20 a month dating subscription fee and just ended up making a bank by monetizing through advertising. So I want to leave some time for our questions, but uh, you know, the day before something becomes a breakthrough, it's just a crazy idea. So I encourage all of you to think about some of the questions I posed here and create a framework about how to create these out-of-this-world ideas that just end up taking a life of their own once they're released into the market. Think really, really big. Tackle really big and challenging problems. Um, don't confine yourself to just making incremental improvements in existing services and software. Think uh, there's a, the world is riper for disruption than ever before. Um, it's much cheaper and easier to get something off the ground in the history of the internet. It's easier to test ideas, to throw stuff out there, create a landing page, send out some emails, go to some customer meetings, create a pitch deck, and show it to your friends and prospective customers. Um, there's really no reason to delay. So I ask you, what's your crazy idea? I think we have uh, a little bit of time for questions, so I'll have to take a couple of questions. Aside from that question, maybe I'll get to later, but a practical question you asked about in terms of um, design. Yes. So I get it except for one part. In order to have two, three hundred people to show a logo, yes. 
obviously they have to invest the time, right? Yes. But only one of them is going to win. Yes. So I would have thought if that was me, logically, if I was you and I was thinking about it, I would say to myself, wow, if let's say 100 people apply, 99 are going to lose out. What's their incentive? Obviously, you solve that problem. That's what I'm asking. What's the incentive of those 99 who aren't going to win to actually put together a good product? They can't do something quickly, otherwise, there's nobody to go for it. Yep. So the question is, why do designers of 99 designs participate in design contests without the guaranteed assurance of payment? And the answer we found to that question is, number one, in some cases, they live in low-cost countries where $300 or $500 is equivalent to a full month's salary. And the second, actually much more important answer to that question is, they use it as sales. So once they win that contest, even if it's only one in 50 contests, they own that customer for life. They create that logo. Now they have a relationship with their customer. They can sell them a brochure, a business card design, letterhead, stationery, banner ads, etc. So just in the same way that you know, designers in Manhattan, they go on sales pitches, they write proposals, they respond to RFPs. They have no guarantee of payment for the time and effort invested in their outbound sales efforts. But you know, many designers aren't very great at sales and marketing. So here they're competing purely based on their talent and not on how nice their RFP proposal is or how competitive their price code is. How do you prevent someone from stealing one of their ideas? So how do we prevent people stealing ideas? Well, we ask all the companies on 99designs to pay up front and we hold their money to they award a winner. So, um, so one of the uh, questions I have is like, the disruption, how do you deal with scale? So one of the things is, OK, I get this word of mouth, I'm getting this big avalanche. And I'll realize why my web server that was like a thousand users instead of hundred thousand. And in terms of my what are the scale challenges? So for us it's really about geographic expansion. We have uh, engineers from Atlanta and Portland and Austin and Utah signing up and we haven't gone to market and create liquidity on both sides of the marketplace. So unfortunately at the moment we're like rejecting a huge portion of the talent that's coming to us organically through word of mouth because we're unable to provide them our experience. Uh, much in the same way that Uber, for a long time, they weren't serving you know, nearly as many cities as they were now. All they simply did is they had a God view mode, and they were able to see on this world map every time someone opened the Uber app and was unable to request a taxi. That's how they prioritized which markets they rolled out into. So I can understand that the marketplace is uh, a connection between sellers and buyers. So how do you bring the sellers and buyers at the same time? Because obviously there's a challenge, right, when you're starting a product. So the second question is, how do you build that trust initially? Because uh, I can imagine four years ago, you started at Nike Nike Designs, right? Yeah. So how did you build that trust to bring those 88 engineers or those 100 users? So building trust, I think you just basically try and take risk elimination to its maximum extreme. So for hired, for example, we don't charge employees unless they successfully hire someone. We don't even ask for a credit card number. We don't even ask for a signed contract. Once they're approved to use our marketplace, we trust that they'll do the right thing and we'll get notified when they make a hire. And we have some systems in place to ensure that happens more than 99.9% .9 of the time. But we took our risk on the to maximum stream. 99 designs, for example, um, to get customers who had never purchased professional graphic design services before, we took risk on the to its extreme by offering the 100% money back guarantee. It was absolutely crazy. It had never been done before. You know, why people just come and see all these ideas and don't pay, but most people are honest, thankfully, so. <laughs> Following up on that question, uh, for a marketplace, you always need to get that critical mass of providers and buyers. And the so, providers won't come till the buyers come, and vice yeah. versa. How do you solve that chicken and egg problem? Well, you always have to focus on the hardest part of the marketplace first. And for most marketplaces, it's usually the demand side. So if you look at Odesk and Elance, you know, their challenge is not finding enough freelance writers and translators and bookkeepers. It's always finding the small business owners that need to hire them. So you always should focus on, on the hardest side of the marketplace first. In our case, we thought it would be the engineers. So that's what we did first to sign up the engineers. Then we were able to go to the employers and say, hey, we have this pool of talent that's potentially interested in talking to you. You can talk to as many people as you want. There's no risk, no upfront fee. You don't have to give us a credit card number. Just log in and if you don't like any of them, tell us to fuck off. And but I'm like, what's the incentive for engineers to sign up when, when they don't know their companies? Because you approach the companies later. Yeah. 
So our pitch to the engineers was find find out how much you're worth, basically. Oh. We elevate them on a pedestal and we appeal to their sense of curiosity. It's like all these companies will potentially make you salary offers up front. You can choose whether or not you want to interview with them based on the numbers they put out there. So a lot of people sign up simply out of curiosity at the beginning. And over time, as the marketplace matured and we had more and bigger and more legitimate companies participating, then that became less of an issue and we were able to filter the engineer town much harder and you know tone down our messaging so it's no longer all about just, you know, find out how much you're worth. It's actually discover your next challenge, find your next perfect match. What were some of your um, biggest learnings while building nighttime designs and hired? I mean things you would have now when you think about it, you would love to do it in a different way. So biggest learnings in building 99 designs and hired. I think at 99 Designs, we probably weren't aggressive enough. We bootstrapped the company for the first three years. We didn't raise our Series A till three years into the business, which was a $35 million Series A from Excel. Um, so because of that, we saw a lot of competitors, clones and copycats emerge. Um, we saw companies launch in Brazil and Europe and Germany. And we ended up acquiring many of those companies at a point in time, but we had the capital earlier on would have been more aggressive in international expansion so these competitors wouldn't have had a chance to establish their foothold in, in international countries. Um, the one good thing that we did at 99designs so was actually we bought 99designs name in 20 different countries. So we have 99designs.it and .sc and .co.jp and we've now launched in like 10 languages in 20 countries. So it's been really useful. If we had waited until much later, we didn't have the foresight to do that. We'd be just dealing with a whole bunch of extortionists and domain name squatters and other lowlife who, you know, of course we have the trademark, but you don't want to go to court and spend six months and fifty thousand dollars in legal bills just to get your name in a country that you need. So, you know, with Hired, for example, we bought Hired.co.uk when we launched in London. Where, there you go. Speaking of swine balls, how are bankers helping? Bankers. So, don't like raise so much equity until your company needs to borrow money to pay for all, etc. What bankers have, what have you learned about being a banker to launch your company? 99 Designs never had any venture debt. It was all bootstrapped and profitable from day one. So, the $35 million was you now cushioned for international expansion and for a rainy day, but we never had to use venture debt. Raj? Yes, so uh, now that we are like super successful, but uh, when you were in the startup stage, like the first year, what were some of the problems you faced and how did you take care of it? So, obviously, um, problems are usually you, know, you have deals of issues with fraud and collections in certain companies. 99 Designs, we built very sophisticated anti fraud technology because we're essentially acting as the middleman. We're collecting the money up front and then paying out designers. And we got charged back four or six weeks later after we had wired the money via Western Union to a designer in Eastern Asia or Eastern Europe would be you know, on the hook for it. So things like that have obviously been frustrating, but they're all solvable problems, I guess. The thing is, you don't know what you're going to run up against until you run up against it. So, an in interest of getting a product to market quickly. It's best not to over-engineer, not to overbuild the technology up front. Um, the first version of Hired was basically just two web forms. You had a web form for developers, we had a web form for the employers, and it's only once we had a database on both sides of the marketplace that we actually built the third tier of technology to connect the two together, and even then it was super primitive. So I think you know, one mistake that ent marketplace entrepreneurs often make is they overthink the problem and try and solve problems before they exist. Um, you, know, you can run a marketplace businesses in email and spreadsheets because all you're doing is connecting buyers and sellers together. So it's actually a really, really good idea to do a lot of shit manually, even though it's painful and it's not scalable, but it helps you intimately learn what the pain points are in the process. So then later on, you're building technology to solve the right problems and not just building technology for the problems that you think you'll have. Is there any policy control that you build into uh, hired or 99 designs to meet out people who are just, you know, opening multiple accounts and submitting multiple designs, stuff like that? So quality control on 99 designs and hired. On 99 designs, any designer can submit designs. We don't ask them to 
you know, submit educational background credentials or anything like that. They're being judged purely on the output of their work. Um, that being said, all first-time designers on 99 Designs have their designs go into a review queue, um, and our internal community team has a look at those designs, and if they are really, really poor quality, then we suspend that designer. That's mainly to maintain perception of quality in the marketplace. You don't want to present clients and paint customers with designs created, you know, bitmap, whatever. Uh, if you create a breakthrough company, then the disruptive model, how do you uh, work in your day-to-day -day to assure that those companies are the ones that are going to disrupt their own model when time comes instead of being disrupted by others? So that's a good question. Um, how do you maintain, how do you ensure that a company you create to disrupt the status quo doesn't get disrupted by the next generation of businesses? Um, so one of the interesting insights that you actually get from the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, is that a lot of the disruption always comes on the lower end. As, as a business, your tendency is to always gravitate towards creating more features, more functionality, more complexity, targeting bigger accounts, more complex customers, etc. So one of the recent launches that we had, 99designs, did the exact opposite thing. We launched a service called Swiftly, where for $15, you can get designs tweaked to actually undercut ourselves and create a new lower end offering serving a market that we didn't know yet exists. Um, you know, so kind of potential competition. So as you grow in your business, you're, you're always thinking about you know, the next step to serve your existing customers and new customers, but sometimes it's just better to scoop up underneath and you know, offer something where you're not even sure it will work. Um, and that's some of the examples that the book the innovators that might get gives is disruptors are often um, creating products and services for a market that isn't immediately identifiable, and the market doesn't even really come to fruition until the product or service is on the market. So, like, if I stock photo went and pulled customers about stock photo usage, the, the feedback probably wouldn't have been as good until um, they created the market and you know offered one dollar stock photos because people didn't know what they didn't know because didn't exist. Well, it's always going to be a, a, a small, you never go in all feed in, in the smallest project that may or may not work out, it's always experimental and MVP. So you don't invest too much time and too much effort. It's always going to be one of several things you have up in the air. But um, you know, in, this, in the model of a lean startup and MVPs, most boards are willing to give the founders and founding team a lot of leeway in, in testing new ideas, even if the market is unclear and even if the price points are lower than what the company has been traditionally used to charging. In the back. I had several examples that tip on my tongue, but I'll get back to you afterwards and have a talk about it. I had a couple. So you said you had a lot of backlash. So what did you do? Did you read what? Or so how, how do we respond to the backlash? So actually, like six months after we launched uh, 99 Designs, we actually got a letter from the American Institute of Graphic Artists saying, please shut down your business. You're hurting our industry and our association. Here's our price book. It says the minimum you can charge for logos, $7,500. So, you know, <laughs> you're really hurting our business. You know, <laughs> we shredded that letter, and now we should reframe it instead. But uh, um, for a long time, I, we actually read like all the comments, all the forum threads, all the blog comments that were against 99 Designs. So it was actually like really, really depressing. I took it really personally, um, and we tried to respond with logic and reasoning, saying, you know, "We're opening up a new market of customers for you. People who are buying $300 logos now, when their businesses grow and mature, might want to hire a designer or an agency and pay $5,000, etc." But at the end of the day, people were so emotional about it because we were attacking their livelihood. And no amount of logic or reasoning or rationalizing could uh, change their mind. So we stopped doing it. We realized that no matter what we did, they would never become fans, they would never become customers, they would never become contributors to the community. So we're much better off focusing our mental energy and our time on serving the clients and the customers and the community that were passionate about what we had and that saw the value of what we were offering. Um, 
unfortunate thing that in our case is that we didn't have any regulatory agencies to deal with, like Airbnb and Uber do. Right? So we could safely ignore the American Institute of Graphic Artists and tell them to fuck off. And they couldn't write a letter to their congressman. They couldn't hire a lobbyist on K Street in Washington um, and get you know, a law or legislation passed against us. So we're pretty unique in that sense. So it's always good to know whether or not you know, you're disrupting in a legal standpoint or whether you're just pissing off the establishment. But in general, you know, the lesson is to focus your time and mental energy on serving the needs of your customers, not only too much about um, negative feedback. How do you differentiate the case of a constructive feedback versus this I mean, it's always important to listen to negative feedback. Sometimes they raise valid points, but that negative feedback is pretty coming from a sense of fear and from you know, uh, uh, a need to hold on to the status quo um, that's very different than actually constructive feedback that allows you to improve your product or service. Yeah, we've had a couple of uh, 99 Designs customers who are actually agencies who are using us to outsource work they had acquired on behalf of clients. I would actually be supportive of that. Some clients actually wanted someone in a business suit who can toggle the link or to show up and drop fancy diagrams on a whiteboard and explain a logo. And clients are willing to pay five or $10,000 to have that assurance, that 50-page report, to explain how the sphere in the logo could, you know, like relates to the axis of the earth and movement and innovation and all this stuff. That's actually a really funny example. If you Google like Pepsi logo explanation, the agency that Pepsi hired to design a logo with an 87 page explanation about the Pepsi logo and like the analogies and the diagrams they drew in that to justify their bullshit one billion one million dollar fee is just absolutely stellar. But some clients are you know need that sort of assurance and they, they wouldn't feel comfortable purchasing for three hundred dollars, they're much more purchasing for five thousand dollars even if what they're getting is the exact same end product. They need that paper to, you know, show their boss and to cover their ass. So, you know, like in the old days, people say, you know, we used to get fired for hiring IBM or for choosing IBM, right? People who, you know, have upper bosses and management that they have to uh, report to or, you know, want the consultant's professional opinion. They want the designers showing up in the boardroom with, you know, fancy presentations and PowerPoints. Exactly, it's good for us. It was yeah, we're we're happy for it because like I mentioned, those customers who have never bought from us because they weren't comfortable spending three hundred dollars for a logo. They felt much more comfortable spending ten thousand dollars for a logo and having a middleman they can call up on the phone and you know show up at their office. Well, I guess that I know designs. Um, when you when you decide to pursue that, you have you have several different disruptive ideas. Like, how what made you choose like pursue like ninety nine design? So 99designs was actually incubated within SitePoint, my previous company. It was very, very lean startup style. As I mentioned earlier, you actually don't have to build a lot of technology to build a marketplace. The first version of 99designs was actually nothing more than a message board where companies would post requests for design work and designers would respond in the comments by attaching images. That was the very first version of 99designs. Second version was we charged the small business owners $10 to post a form thread and designers will again reply in the in the comments with attachments and their design submissions. So it was only after we saw a lot of traction in that in that first version of the crowdsource graphic design concept that we decided to create a new company and new model around it and spin off as its own separate brand, but had uh, it had life of its own. Yeah, we tried like we always we always tested numerous ideas. Like one one thing that we tested also was like namemythingy.com, <laughs> which was like crowdsourced naming, um, which was very tricky actually because of trademarks and domain name availability and all the complexity around that. And that idea didn't work. Um, so you know we we test and fail a lot. I don't know if this is an answer before, but uh, what's your 
what about like the marketplace problem, like 99design and hive.com, like any both parties right to have a successful like a business. And I'm, I'm trying to start like a marketplace startup too, and there's this problem, like how do, which one do I get first? Yeah. I mean, uh, out of all the types of businesses to start, you have to be extra special crazy to start a marketplace business. Because for most companies, you only have to find a buyer. You have to find the buyer and the seller. And you have to find them in equal proportion to each other. As the entire shit entire thing tips over and falls apart. Um, so the answer I gave to this question earlier was to focus on the hardest side of the marketplace, which is usually the uh, buyer side. But initially, you need to have the supply in order to approach the buyers with an interesting value proposition. Uh, so my co-founder, Doug Fiercey, previously founded a company called LiveOps, which is a distributed call center. Um, and he actually went and signed up hundreds of home agents first before he approached the direct TV marketers and said, you know, I have all these people who want to answer calls when people respond to your late night TV commercials. So you have to have enough supply to make it interesting for the buyer to at least talk to you and pick up the phone and have a conversation. What are some of the steps that you take to validate the market? Like, what are some other milestones? I think the So validating ideas. I'll give you the example of, of Hired, because that was very MVP style. Um, literally, the first thing we did in that company was build a single one-page sign-up form for engineers. We said, we'll put you up for auction, find out how much you're worth, interview with as many or as few companies as you want, no obligation, nothing, no cost, no credit card required. Then we went out and we emailed a couple hundred engineers. They actually signed up in droves. So that was our validation. If we hadn't been able to convince engineers that there's something in it for them, for signing up for the service, we would have stopped right there. So that was like first test. The second test was getting the employers to sign up. We thought, you know, once we have all these engineers, it'll be very easy to go to all the startups. I'll just go on monster.com or startupjobs.com and search for Rails in San Francisco and email the CEO of every company that's hiring Rails engineers in San Francisco and say, Come to come to my marketplace and hire some engineers. We have the solution to your problem. And what happened actually is that nobody responded to those emails. A single CEO signed up as a result of those emails. I sent a lot of emails, and there's a lot of open jobs in San Francisco for Rails engineers and iOS engineers and all the other positions that we were try that we had engineers for. So the interesting lesson from that was that sometimes you have to find a uh, another way to get access to your prospective customers. And in our case, the solution to our problem was emailing the investors of those tech companies and getting a warm introduction rather than going straight to the CEO ourselves. Because that gave us a lot of credibility and they were willing to try us. Even though I thought they would all respond to my initial emails, because the value proposition I felt was so strong. So it was like, no print fee, no credit card, talk to as many people as you want. But just thankfully, we didn't give up. So far, no founder problems, no co-founder problems whatsoever. Um, we've had problems with senior management team members. Um, I guess the challenge there is you have to be careful about where you're recruiting from. In our case, we recruited a senior management team member who had worked at a really big corporation with tens of thousands of employees. He was their youngest ever ranking executive in that company. And what we didn't realize at the time is the way you rise up in job titles at a big 20,000, 30,000 person organization is you get really good at playing politics. So that was that was his strength. And that's why he was able to rise through the ranks. Unfortunately, when you're running a 30 or 40 or 50 person company, those skills are very, very different. You can't play politics. You can't create politics. You can't do all those things. So that was like one, one management hiring mistake that we made was taking someone out of that big corporate environment and selling them in a management position at a much smaller company where they're where they were good at, where they were the best at, didn't necessarily play well. Um, and that and it really badly. Um, so with hire the buy side is the uh, company, right? We can also say the buy side is the engineers because they have an infinite amount of options. Okay, so are you seeing any kind of um, like social capital I mean, the engineers that are, that are going to be getting the jobs, did social capital matter at all to the uh, company? 
what sense social capital in terms of. Gary, is it more than just, you know, are you a Rails dev? <laughs> you um, we have not seen anybody hiring based on cloud scores or Twitter followers. We don't even, when we did our data analysis, we actually didn't even find that GitHub helped a lot. Um, a lot of the best engineers actually don't have a lot of open source contributions, which makes sense because they're spending 16, 70 hours a week working for their boss and doing their jobs. Uh, <laughs> so there was actually no statistical correlation, even though employees like to say, you know, have to have a good GitHub account, you might get to know this, and you might get more spam emails from recruiters if your libraries are trending on GitHub, but um, has no correlation as to how well you actually interview for the job and whether or not you get a final job offer letter. If you extrapolate your um, strategy, do you think you flatten the world for every kind of service and product? And do you think that you end up having more people in different countries that don't have this opportunity that encourage existing staff support? I think we do definitely flatten the world and open up a whole new realm of opportunity. So 99designs actually our vision and the mantra that we live by was create opportunity for designers. Like, yes, we served our customers, and if we did the right thing by our customers, they would tell their friends, and they'd come and buy more. But at the end of the day, it was about creating opportunity for designers, um, whether that's through crowdsourced graphic design, whether that's through one-on-one -on -one projects, whether it's through design tweaks at Swiftly, et cetera. Did you ever, during the process, pivot? Did you move from one uh, idea that you had I mean, we tested many business ideas that didn't pan out, but 99designs has more or less been the same since its inception. We've changed some minor tweaks around the dynamics of the marketplace, changed pricing and categories and how we sell a message, but it's been uh, relatively stable. Same thing with Hyric, um, though initially we called the business developer auction, though that was very limiting. Um, and the word auction was also associated with a lot of negative things. So it was actually very polarizing initially. We had some strong negative feedback, especially from employers around the developer option name. They said, you're just going to drive up the price of talent, and you're going to be creating all these mercenaries, and I don't want to compete based on price. You have a great culture. And it was never about price, but we pivoted to the hired name also to allow us to cover off a much broader swath of job categories. So as we needed to hire a designer, we announced designers as a category, and we hired our designer, and we need to hire data scientists, so we launched a data science category and hired, and we hired only data scientists. Most recently, we need a product manager, so we open up a product manager category on hired, and we'll probably do the same for me as a job category over the next couple of years. So why are candidate profiles available for just a week on Hired.com? That's really to create a sense of urgency for the employers. And number two, it's to um, to protect the candidate's privacy. So a job search is something that's very private. Most of the people on Hired um, don't necessarily are unemployed. and be employed. They want their boss finding out. So by limiting the scope of their job search to just a week and their profile disappears forever, it, uh, it protects their privacy and it forces employers to review their profiles and make a go or no go decision in a very short amount of time. And then allows us to do these weekly auctions. And every week, we get employees addicted to logging in on Monday mornings and making their interview requests, and etc. Um, so time pressure has been very, very important to success. Otherwise, we're just building a huge resume database, which exists on many other websites. The idea is that everybody on a marketplace has intent to start interviewing for jobs next week. So you better act now because they're going to get multiple offers if you don't. Airlines industry. I read an interesting stat and said that the airline industry has taken more money from investors than has ever paid it back. So if you add up all the airlines created on the entire planet, and all the investor money that's gone into them, and you looked at all the profits that the airlines has, has earned, it's like a net negative. So uh, I don't have to be crazy to do that.
Well, create the first company was the most difficult thing. So when I started my first company, I was 14 years old. Um, and I was actually, I was an online content website. I was getting a lot of traffic, and I was selling advertising to a lot of Silicon Valley firms. And they actually always wanted to talk to me on the phone to like close these ten, twenty thousand dollar ad sale deals. So I would actually schedule all my calls at the local Starbucks, and I'd always say, you know, I have a hard stop for another meeting at 1 p.m. And in reality, that was like social studies class. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, trying to hide my age and you know, trying to make that work, and then come back to social studies class, so you know, close a five or ten thousand dollar deal. Be Feeling pretty smug about myself. <laughs> um, what's the hardest thing now? I mean, just uh, never gets easy. The stress. I mean, it's it's all consuming. It take, you s I have dreams about hires on a daily basis. I stress about clients and candidates, and I'm checking my phone the first thing when I do when I wake up, and I spend more time with my business partners than my wife. I text up much more often than do my wife. It's 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 all encompassing. So. You know, once you're an entrepreneur, it, it just consumes your life, and you, know, you have high of you your days when you're thinking you're going to take over the world, and then you have your lows where you think you can go out of business and have to fire all your employees, and then and it's like a crazy roller coaster. It's, uh, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's always dealing with yourself and managing yourself and managing your emotions, and it's probably always the most challenging thing. Back there. I've, what do I do to keep myself level-headed and deal with the emotional roller coaster ride of finding a company? I've always had co-founders. Um, I know some people who have started companies by themselves, and I have no fucking idea how they do it. I mean, it really helps to have someone who is going through the same thing at the same time that you are, and you know, being able to balance each other out and keep yourselves motivated to keep going and see through the hard times. Um, going solo as an entrepreneur, just, yeah. So can you tell, talk a little bit more about how you, like when you experiment your ideas, and like how far do you go, how much time do you invest in those, and like at what point, like how many users do you look for? Because I have a lot of ideas, I've won some back down <laughs> prizes, and people like those ideas, and I want to like iterate on top of those, but I don't know like how far to take and how much time to invest on those. Uh, so any uh, guidelines on that? I mean, that it's... Liking ideas is one thing. Taking out your credit card and paying for something is different. So get those people who like your ideas to you know, speak with their cold hard cash. And if you can't convert them, then you know, it's time to change your value proposition. That being said, you know you have to be clever and not not give up too early. Like the first auction that we ran for hired completely failed. Not a single person got hired. We didn't make a single cent. Like I mentioned earlier, we also completely failed at signing up any employees. So we started talking to their investors. So sometimes it takes a little bit of ingenuity to get the ball rolling. Um, you don't want to fail. You don't want to give up on your first failure. But at the same time, if all signs point to no, then how many months or how many like users do you look for? I have no idea. That's like it depends on the situation. I would say. I mean, so you look at growth and traction, and then you look at your net promoter scores. So the net promoter scores, how many people couldn't couldn't live. If your product didn't exist, how passionate are the users and customers that you have? And are people coming back over and over again? Are they telling their friends? Um, some interesting metrics to look at. So how much of social media helped you to grow the business, like Facebook, Twitter? Social media? So I have a Facebook account. <laughs> I mean, it's, it could be good for advertising. I mean, Facebook advertising can be very targeted for a certain be very effective for certain types of companies, but um, you know, Twitter is you know kind of pissing in the wind half the time. It's box following you. Did you guys buy the domain hired.com? Yes. Can you tell me how much you paid for it? Six figures. That's it. Yeah. Like a nice car. <laughs> the, the the owner of the domain name hired.com had owned it since 1998. Um, so we bought it and we didn't announce it for a few months. And those few months that we owned it, I kept getting an average of like three emails a week from people trying to buy it off of me. So I imagine over those ten years, I had 
in close to 10,000 attempts to buy the domain name, something crazy like that. So why he finally decided to sell us, I don't know, because our offer was high, but wasn't out of this world. Um, you have to use like a agent, or I mean, just kind of figure out who it was and call them. Like my my 99 Designs co-founder has a fake name and a fake email account, post, yeah. and you just just that it negotiated that way. So in general, you want to use your name, especially if you're well known or people can Google you and find that you, know, you have some backing or whatever. So you can use all your negotiating edge. And how it was actually our last choice. We went through many, many attempts to buy other names for the company that, were much, that we thought would be much cheaper or uh, much more interesting. Hire was actually like our last kind of step in the road. How did you find your co-founder? And how did you find your first engineer that you want to use while you're thinking around that person? Okay, so I have two co-founders. Um, my co-founder was technical, Alan Grant. Was the CTO of the company. I met him when he hacked 99 designs, <laughs> and we banned him. So I thought that was very entrepreneurial of him, and I had known him for several years. Um, my second co-founder, Doug Fierstein, we were actually on the marketplace panel together one evening, talking about stuff like this. Afterwards, we went to an uh, Indian restaurant that you know, plays rap music, and we started drinking pictures of beer, and we're you know, lamenting about our inability to hire engineers. Alan, who's the CTO, I just spent a week at Rails conference. He spent you know over five thousand dollars on a ticket, flights, and hotel, trying to recruit engineers for his own company. He had been completely unsuccessful. Spent a week and five grand, came up empty-handed. Said, "Fuck this! I'll build the MVP product. This helps me hire a single engineer. I'll be worth my time." Um, and now he works full time <laughs> on this. So. Any other questions, Raj? I mean, healthcare is probably one of the most difficult markets to disrupt them because of all the regulation and because a lot of the budgets are controlled by big bureaucracies. So you kind of want to find industries where you can get early adopters who have decision making capability and are willing to try new things. Um, there was a great blog post on Panda Daily the other week, and it basically said solve big, blatant problems. Don't solve problems that are aspirational and that require a lot of selling. Um, Paul Graham also had a blog post along similar lines. He basically said, you know, solve a narrow problem that's very deep. Find something that's so painful that companies are willing to take a risk working with a two or three person startup. Because if you can solve a pain point problem for them, they'll, they'll be so thrilled. Um, worth checking out those blog posts. I can send you links afterwards. Are we on time? Okay, a few more questions. Ideas you are bringing other partners. What is the revolution? One more time. So you have the business idea. You are bringing your other co-founders. The business idea was co collaborative, so I, all three of us. Never be your own. Can not bring the team. But not your own. Because collaborate with all of you. The idea was collaborative, so we were. We I didn't even know who blurted it out when we were drinking. <laughs> Here at the pub, but uh, <laughs> I think we were all too drunk at that point to remember. But uh, the 99 designs, I mean, the idea grew up organically out of uh, out of out of sight point. There was like an even split between me and my business partner. Uh, you may have heard of Virtual Point, uh, like when Site Point was being used. Yep. And uh, Virtual Point helps you sell websites, domain names, all of that. But the usual uh, problem with DP was uh, the spam. And the low volume offers. How did you end up, you know, making site point? <laughs> so when you go to site point or other domain marketplaces that you own, uh, the quality was inherently better. So how did you achieve that? And how do you keep all these spammers out? So the question is, if you're running a marketplace, how do you keep up spammers and low bidders and low quality listings? And the answer for that is simply curation. So on hired, we keep out bad companies. We keep out bad candidates to optimize the experience. Just the same way that Lyft and Uber get all their drivers to ensure a consistent experience. So that's, kind of that's one of the interesting things about marketplace that you have to decide early on is are you going to curate or are you not going to curate? Um, how much creation is too much? 
at what point are you just choking growth? That's something that's you know, a very, very critical decision. But is this curation manual? Uh, so initially for hired, I was the sole cur curator. Okay. I reviewed every single engineer that made into the auctions. Yeah, what can be outsourced? I can tell you the names probably can be crowdsourced since I tried it. That was a tough one. I mean, the, the thing with crowdsourcing is the project has to be short and simple enough that someone can take a risk on doing it without really affecting their livelihood. So logo might take an hour or four hours if someone has inspiration. You probably can't crowdsource a book. You can't ask someone to write a 300-page novel. You only pay one person for that unless the number is really, really high. We have some fantastic examples of crowdsourcing. Even Netflix crowdsourced its recommendation algorithm to pay out a $1 million bounty um, for the data science team that was able to create the biggest improvement over their status quo. So, I mean, generally crowdsourcing applies well to small, smaller projects, these bit sized pieces of work, not something particularly complex or something that requires a 50 page briefing document or an inane understanding of a particular company or industry or... So then why didn't the naming work? Because it's quite small and short. Yeah, so exactly. So we thought naming would work because it's it's short and simple and anybody can start with a dictionary and turn out names for companies or products or services. It didn't work because the companies that were the contest holders essentially um, often were running into trademark issues or domain name availability issues. So like, I love all these names. It's going to take me forever to get research on the trademarks on these, and then most of them don't have the domain names available, etc. cetera. There have been three or four other companies that have tried it. I think Nameforce was one of them. Um, and it's just really difficult. Well, Last question? Regarding the uh, budget, uh, So all the, all the companies I found, they're still operational. So none of them have, have folded. There's many ideas. Yeah, ideas. And uh, uh, countless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can't even count how many I failed. Um, yeah. One of the biggest oh shit moments ever came, you know, when the dot com implosion happened, March of 2000. Um, at that point, my entire business was relying, reliant on advertising sales. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, every company that we worked with started going back up because they weren't able to raise their venture capital, and we had you know, all this traffic. We had employees, we had an office. The company was bootstrapped, so you know we had we didn't have a huge pile of cash as a cushion. Um, that was definitely one of the uh, more oh shit moments. And the solution that we came up with was simply by analyzing what people were doing on our site, and it turned out that when people were learning to program PHP or JavaScript or what have you, is they were printing out their tutorials and having it sitting next to their keyboard so they could follow along. So the most popular link on our site was print this article. It actually makes sense because you think about it, back in like 1999, 2000, people didn't have two monitors on their desk. And they did have a monitor, it was one of those big ass motherfucking bulking CRTs, right? So if you were programming and learning to code and you follow your tutorial, it was much easier to have that printout next to your keyboard that you could follow along rather than switching back and forth between Windows and your computer. So what we decided to do to make money is we decided to turn our most popular article into a print on demand book. By a week, week and a half to put together, so I tried to pay $5 for it, and the book went on to sell like 20,000 copies. That was like our MVP test. You know, will people pay us for the privilege of having the content printed out on their behalf? That was actually a little bit disruptive at the time as well, because we became the only tech publisher in the world that sort of had a direct to consumer model. It's not just the same way, you know, Bonneville's pants, you can't buy Nordstrom or Macy's. All our books, you can only buy through SitePoint.com. And that meant that we didn't have to give up 55 or 60 percent of our margin to Borders and Barnes and Noble. What most people don't realize is that the bookstores are basically, you know, work on a contingency basis. The publishers ship truckloads of books out to the retailers, and those books and products don't sell. They come back as returns, and you have to give back your money to Borders and Barnes and Noble. And plus, if they do sell, you give up 55 or 60 percent of your margin. We're having a direct consumer model. We have crazy high margins. We were printing books for three dollars and selling them for forty. So, and we were able to have build a long-term relationship with our customers. If you went on to buy five, ten books of ours, and like if you talk to like Wiley, who owns the Four Dummies series, they have no fucking idea who their customers are. How to notify them that a new edition of the JavaScript book comes out? 
like, just have to ship off another car, no books to borders, they get stuck on the shelf, hopefully in the right category, and if they don't sell, just give the money back, so. Thank you. So we have some prizes uh, for the disruptive innovation uh, tweets we have uh, received. So I'm going to let uh, Matt choose uh, two of uh, his favorites. So these are the five. Okay, so the uh, the winner, uh, uh, one of the winner is uh, disrupting the sleeping giant called convention by Sophia. Sophia here. All right. And uh, the second winner is uh, looking at existing ideas upside down so by Pashmin. All right. And the last one is uh, from the fish ball. They got some business cards, so I let Matt uh, select one of them and uh, see the third prize. <laughs> Amy Cagle. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. So thanks a lot to all of you uh, for coming tonight. And uh, now we know uh, if you need a logo, where to go. <laughs> if you need uh, some tutorials, where to go. And also, if you need some genius. <laughs> So thanks a lot, and uh, uh, we have got some beer uh, in the in back, uh, and then uh, uh, wait for a few more minutes. I mean, 10, 15 more minutes for some social networking. And all right.
Well, yeah, I was thinking that the oh, no. I was thinking that during the